You're listening to Glove Up or Shut Up on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. You're listening to Glove Up or Shut Up on AngryMarks.com with Peter H. and Stevie J. Find them on Twitter at HardcoreCDN and at Angry Marks. And now, for all the news, reviews, and interviews in mixed martial arts, it's time for Glove Up or Shut Up from AngryMarks.com. And welcome everybody to another episode of Glove Up or Shut Up, right here on AngryMarks.com. My name is Peter H. I'm joined once again by my co-host from Omaha, Nebraska, Stevie J. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. No. Well, Just no. I have no choice. It's happening here whether I want it to or not. And we're getting freezing rain here tonight and overnight tonight, so tomorrow's Trek to Work will be brought to you by my skates in the closet. Well, you could just put some chains on your tires and get to work that way. There you go. <laughs> and, of course, this is the big Super Bowl weekend, the big pay-per-view. Oh, wait. Not a pay-per-view. Nope. Downgraded to a fight night with Hendrix and Wonder Boy. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But, Peter, who do you think's winning the Super Bowl on Sunday? Do you got the Broncos or the Panthers? I might surprise some people with this pick. I'm going with the Panthers. Do you think it's youth over experience? Is that why you're making the call? Um, yes and no. There are certain elements of the, the Panthers offense, which I'm really excited for in this game. But I find when youth meets experience on a big stage, I don't think there's a bigger stage out there. I think we're going to get a closer score than what some pundits are predicting. I think this game will come down to three points or less, and it's going to take some miraculous catch like the one we saw with the Giants and the Patriots when the guy caught the ball in his helmet. We're not getting the blowout like we got in the divisional round. We're not getting the Panthers no. just running away with it completely. No, absolutely not. And the Denver Broncos defense is what you would call a shutdown defense. They make good mm-hmm. teams look bad. They did it to the Patriots. So who are you picking in this game? I'm with you in that I think it'll be a narrow margin. I'm going to lean just ever so slightly to the Broncos. Again, watching what they did to the Patriots, I thought that was the best manhandling of that offense we'd seen all season long. And if they're capable of doing that to the Patriots, I think they can do it to Cam Newton too. So Stevie J is picking against Omaha. I'm actually picking for Omaha, if you consider Peyton Manning says it every play. <laughs> All right, so we got some big news this week with uh, Hendo signing with Bellator. Indeed, that took over the internet, that broke MMA fighting, that actually took down their website for a little bit. And I wonder if you can still buy Benson Henderson merch on Bell- on UFC's uh, shop.com, whatever it's called. Well, you know what's really interesting to me about the whole thing is that both sides were extremely complimentary to each other. Dana White said Mm -hmm. nothing but nice things about Benson. Benson said nothing but nice things about Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta. It was the most cordial parting of the ways you'll ever see from a former UFC champion and its promotion. Usually Dana White kicks people on their way out the door. Because he wants to leave the door open for another uh, return one day. Well, I don't know. I think Benson is at the tail end of his career here. I don't think he'll be coming back to UFC, but maybe as an ambassador or a Hall of Famer, but probably not as a competitor. The power retire his toothpick. You know, part of the reason that he made this decision is because even though UFC offered a incentive-loaded contract that would have paid him more to become a champion, Bellator offered him more money up front for his first fight, and he's got to look at it, I can get paid more now, or I can get paid more later if I become a champion again, and if you weigh those two offers at Benson's point in his career, taking more money to may or may not become a champion is probably better than taking an end-loaded contract where he might not ever get there. He's getting more money in the short term. He's going to be fighting a new crop of fighters. And 
the one part of the deal that I don't agree with, he gets an automatic title shot. That's the irony. Now, when it was first announced, he didn't have an opponent. Nobody knew which weight class he was going to be fighting in. And everybody started mm-hmm. salivating over the ideas. It's like, ooh, he can go back to lightweight now. We can get Benson Anderson versus Will Brooks. We can get a rematch of Benson Anderson and Josh Thompson. We can get Benson Anderson and Michael Chandler. All these hypothetical scenarios started playing out. But no. Benson wants to stay at welterweight. And the double irony he gets a title shot. So even though he could have earned more money by working his way up to a title shot in UFC, he gets more money now, and he gets the title shot against Andre Koroshkov because he decided to stay at welterweight. And there's every chance in the world that he could win that fight because we've seen what happens when you put Benson in a world title fight and it goes five rounds. He gets a lot of decisions that people don't always agree with, but he manages to outpoint people over and over again. Now, if he wins that fight, he joins a very elite group, doesn't he? Of people who've been a Bellator and a UFC champion? I'd say so. In fact, he'd probably be the only one to have ever been Bellator, UFC, and WEC. He'd probably be singular Mm -hmm. in that respect. Yeah, that's uh, a feather in the cap for sure. Mm -hmm. And in two weight classes, too. That's another thing that he could feather in his cap, because how many people are two weight class champions in their career. Most people are lucky to get one. Yeah. Do you think this deal will have ramifications with the Reebok pay structure in the future? I think it's indicative of the fact that the Reebok pay structure is not enough to make up for what guys lose by sponsorship because it's not just the fact that he got a little bit more money to come to Viacom. We don't know how much exactly. But we do know that he gets all his sponsorships now, which he couldn't under the Reebok deal. And for a lot of guys who are making the jump, guys like Phil Davis and Josh Thompson, those sponsorships make a world of difference to their bottom line. Not to discount those two fighters, but... And I'm going to use pro wrestling in this example because I can't think of a better analogy. But do you think this could ignite something vaguely similar to, like, the Monday Night Wars, where this is, like, a first serious shot that's been fired? I think there's always been a low-level war between Bellator and UFC. I don't think it's ever been not a war, because they've run shows on the same night, they've run shows in the same market, they've run shows using each other's talent when there were lawsuits still being pending and settled. (laughs) It's, It's very much a case of they're in competition with each other, and the, the difference here is that it's more like, I hate using a wrestling analogy here because people are going to get mad at this, but it's mm-hmm. more like WWE versus TNA, where TNA will acknowledge WWE because they're the smaller company, but WWE doesn't ever have to acknowledge TNA. They can pretend it doesn't exist, and UFC will be at war with Bellator, but they'll never acknowledge they're at war with Bellator. Fair enough. I just see a lot of parallels right now, and Benson Henderson is a very high-profile get for Bellator. It's one of their best acquisitions, but I would say it ranks right up there with when they had Rampage, and I would say it's concurrent to getting Josh Thompson and getting Phil Davis. I'd say that, again, the writing is on the wall here, that guys who aren't happy with Reebok, who are coming to the end of their UFC contract, they have options now, and Viacom is willing to spend the money. So the reason I bring this up is because I got a message from someone and basically making the joke that Benson Henderson is is Scott Hall and Viacom is CNN, and I'm like, oh my god, don't don't go there right now. That's a bridge too far. I wouldn't even try to put that analogy together. But you can tell when a pro wrestling fan is learning everything about mixed martial arts, and you're like, no, just, just no. Was this your buddy Al? I mean, one is real, and no, 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 it's not my buddy Al. I would think he would know more about it than that. I've read his Facebook wall. He seems pretty up on the take. <laughs> no, he's pretty cool. Um, it's just, I get random, like, tweets, messages, what have you, and it's like, do you even listen to the show? Do you even listen to Mixed Martial Arts, or are you just trolling me right now? Because sometimes I don't know. 
Speaking of random tweets, I got one from The People's MMA the other day. And no, it has nothing to do with The Rock, although he might be a fan. I didn't ask. Mm. And he sent me a tweet and asked me about the punctuation in a title on an article. And I said, you know, I don't write the titles. I write the articles. MMA Mania writes the titles for me. He's like, oh, okay, just check it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> nice guy. I mean, I understand where he was coming from. But at the same time, it's like, you know what? Those are editorial decisions above my level. I don't make them. All right. So, you know, we got the big news out of the way. Let's move on to what happened UFC on Fox this past weekend. And uh, the main event had Anthony Rumble Johnson against Ryan Darth. Don't call me Anakin Bader. And he probably wishes he was Darth or Anakin because Ryan Bader didn't have any chance in that fight. He went for one takedown. He got stuffed immediately. He went for an armbar to try to save himself. And once he couldn't hold on to it anymore, he got pounded into flatness. He got pancaked out by the power of Rumble Johnson. It was quick, one-sided, and merciless. Now, I know you can't do this on press row, but when I watch a fight, like... I was doing like a running commentary and I was saying, okay, see, they're, they're feeling each other right now. They're just trying to get their timing down. And oh, look, Bader went for a takedown. What a surprise. You know, everybody knew he was going to do it, but I think everybody includes Anthony Johnson in this case because he blocked that perfectly. Oh yeah. He stuffed it good. Yeah. What I was thinking he was going to do was the old, uh, I forget who he fought, but last he went for a takedown in a fight, and the guy threw an uppercut and knocked him out. Yeah, that is a possibility. You know, you want to scout that move. If you see somebody going for a takedown, just throw a knee and nail him right as they dive. Yeah, so Bader had the arm. I mean, and Rogan was, like, almost screaming into the microphone, don't let go of the arm, don't let go of the arm. And well, everybody knew it was going to happen the moment he let go of it. He was going to get destroyed. And it's like, I'm, I'm stuck between Johnson and the fence. It's like, oh, this guy's screwed. And it was like, okay, death from above, one punch, two punch. Um, yeah, he's out. I know some people, okay. some minority of people out there were complaining about the stoppage on this one, but when you saw Ryan Bader go, down flat, he was not yeah. moving, he was not defending himself. That was a good stoppage. He was not going to fight back. No, when he is, what's the phrase, intelligently defending himself? There was no defense, intelligent or otherwise. He no. got walloped. No, he when you're when you're basically just like planking in the cage and the guy is raining bombs. Yeah, referee, good call. I mean, I'm glad Bader was okay after the stoppage, but it was still a good stoppage. He didn't need to take any more shots. And he looks like he's 100% healthy, no injuries or anything. He just got knocked the F out. No, no, but as far as Johnson's concerned, he didn't, like, break his hand on Bader's oh, jaw oh, or anything. Oh, I see what you're saying. I thought you were talking about Bader. No. Bader sat right up. He seemed to be fine. Just, you got knocked out, man. What do you mean to say? Like, oh, this will be the end of your, uh, your winning streak and, uh, just go back and win some more fights and climb that ladder once again. Yeah, it's the end of his winning streak, and it's also the end of his top uh, top rankings in the light heavyweight because he's slid down to number five now. Glover Teixeira moves up one to number four. Bader Glover would be pretty good. Mm, I think Teixeira would probably do the same thing to him. Yeah, Bader and Johnson, or uh, Johnson and uh, Glover both have that extremely, like, powerful punch, you know, like. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I honestly can see if, I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but if Ovin mm -hmm. St. Pru knocks out Fei Zhao, he could probably leapfrog over Bader and maybe even Tejera. Maybe. I mean, OSP He's, versus Glover would be interesting. Right, but what I'm saying is that's as far as OSP could get. He could go over Vader because he just lost. He could go over Teixeira because he's not really doing much right now. 
but he's not getting above Gustafson, Johnson, or Jones. No. No, no. The Mauler is definitely... He ain't going anywhere. And that's a fight I would like to see. Put Mauler against Vader or Mauler against OSP. I would love that fight. If OSP leapfrogs Glover, then make it OSP and the Mauler. Mm -hmm. That'd be good. Yeah. Well, anyway, Put that on the main card. Yeah, uh, of a fight night or a Fox show or even a prelims of a pay-per-view. That'd be a good fight. Don't put that on a prelim, no. No, dude. it could be the top fight on the prelims, like the, the main fight before it goes to pay-per-view. Don't pay favor these guys. Come on, now. Well, it depends on what you want. Do you want more exposure or do you want to be on the pay-per-view? Sometimes... The second time I've used a different... <laughs> second time on this show, I think in the show's history, I've used favor as a verb. <laughs> Well, we have made verbs out of several people on this show. It's not unprecedented. No. All right. So with that fight out of the way, Rumble Johnson, I mean, what do you do with him? He's the next. Dana White said it. He said, whoever wins when Cormier and Jones fights, he's next. And Rumble said, I want either guy. I don't care who. What? <laughs> I mean, who would he rather fight? Would you rather fight Jones or would he rather fight Cormier? I know he says, I'll take whoever, but you got to think there's someone he prefers to fight. Well, I would imagine it would be more fun for him to fight Jones just because that's a completely new opponent. Mm -hmm. And Cormier has already shown the winning strategy with Rumble is to just outlast the power shots, out-wrestle him, and then choke him out. So... He probably thinks that Cormier has his number. He might not want to admit it, but he might deep down know it. All right, I'm just getting some news here. Um, UFC light heavyweight Abdul Karim Edelov failed a US ADA test before making his debut in the Octagon. Ooh, well, that's no good. Speaking of which, did you hear that Demetrius Johnson got a knock on the door from USADA while he was doing a live stream? <laughs> There's a bathroom joke there somewhere. Oh, it literally is, because the people he was talking to on the stream were saying things like, wouldn't it be funny if USADA showed up during the middle of this and asked you to take a piss test? And then there was a loud knocking on his door, and it was USADA asking him to take a piss test. It was like, holy shit, these guys called it. And then you can hear him arguing with the guys that, hey, I'm doing a live internet stream. They're like, no, you pee in this cup right now. <laughs> All right, so I heard two other names got surprise tests, but these two names got knocks on their door at 6 in the morning. That's how they do it these days. They're showing up early and surprising people. Yeah, but the two names I heard, not exactly known for... Drug, drug problems, you know what I mean? They're not, I know they're going after everybody, you know right. what I mean? Doesn't it's, matter if you're okay. Totally random. You don't have to have failed before. You just have to be signed to UFC. That's all there is. But you want to know who the names are? All right, I'm waiting for you to tell me. You've been handing at it. Misha Tate. Yeah. And CM Punk. Yeah, I already heard both of those, so you're not telling me anything new. But. The, CM Punk said something about the dogs were barking and they weren't too pleased with some stranger at the door looking for a piss sample. Mm -hmm. and I think Misha was a little more accepting of it because she's been around for a little while and she's like, oh, well, it sucks to get me out of bed at this hour of the morning, but it's what you got to do to be a fighter. Yeah, but it's like, I think she said she's going right back to bed. Exactly. She's like, I'll get up, I'll do what you want, and I'm going right back to bed. That's that. That would be my attitude too, as a pro fighter. I'd be like, "Okay, you want my sample? Here, I'm going back to bed now. Good night." Oh man, I don't understand. Like you're making your debut in the UFC, and just yeah, I know. It's, it's never a good time to get popped. I guess it's it's stupid, but so is Nick Diaz smoking a joint before he takes a piss test. Oh, uh, we're not going there again. I'm not saying we are. I'm just saying. Some people just can't help themselves when it comes to stupidity. Speaking <laughs> of which, are we going to talk about the rest of this card? Because uh, there was a stupid tap out. No, no, we'll get there. We have to talk about Ben Rothwell and Josh Barnett. Yeah, that one was not stupid. That was a very excellent go-go choke. And Barnett was screwed, and he knew it, and he tapped. And 
That's the first time he's tapped to anything other than an injury. So a very impressive win for Big Ben Rothwell, who did not cut the cackling whoa, promo afterward. Everybody wanted him to this time, and he didn't. What I was impressed with was these are two big boys in the octagon. Oh, like, yes. We're, we're talking top of the heavyweight scale here. Uh, okay, I know I'm dating myself, but where's the beef? <laughs> That was 500 pounds of supple muscle. Jesus. I mean, I feel bad for Barnett because this could be the end of his very successful run. I mean, his next fight, that'll be very telling because he's no spring chicken. There's, uh. <laughs> well, you know what? He's just fine though because he's got a commentary job. He's got a, basically a, a position for life in New Japan and or with UFC, so he's got ways to earn money other than fighting for a living. I bet you he misses Morrow, though. I'm sure he does. I, they probably still talk. Knowing them, I bet they talk. Anyway, Ben Rothwell moves two spots up to number five, and Barnett slips one spot down to number nine. Still a top ten fighter, though. Yeah, hmm. I think that's fair. They were 7-8 and eight before the fight, so no reason for him to drop all the way out. All right, let's talk about Jimmy Rivera and Uri Alcantara. And pretty much what I thought was going to happen was what happened. Jimmy Rivera was on a long winning streak and was a little underrated, and Uri Alcantara was a ranked fighter, but not the most devastating of guys in that division, and Rivera basically found his number and worked his way to a unanimous decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, to kick off the main card, Brian Barberina against Sage Northcutt. Now, you've got to give me your opinion of this tap, because I've already hinted what my opinion of it was. It looked like a variation. Um, there's... I forget the term, but it was like a a randomly used choke that goes right like on the point of where where Barbarina had it. It's like a gulp choke or something. Like it's something. It's not used very often, but when it hits, it hits perfectly. Well, that's the excuse people are using to explain why Northcut tapped. If you're a Northcut, not an excuse. Well, okay, so. The position Barbarina was in when he put this arm triangle on didn't look like anything Sage Northcutt should be tapping to. Like, one in a million chance it was just put on there perfectly and it just didn't look that way. But it didn't look mm -hmm. like Northcutt was in that much trouble when he tapped out. It looked like he was just, he was not even willing to try to get out of it. He just said, fuck it and quit. Well... I know some of the shine is off Northcutt now, but do you think his next fight, his opponent will go for a submission and we'll really see, or do you think he'll be more, better prepared? Well, I think he's going to be better prepared because he's going to train at TriStar full time now. No mm -hmm. more of his, no more of his parents pulling him out of camp. Three fights in three months and he moved up in weight class. Yeah, there were a lot of things that were done wrong, including how much his family interfered with his training and how many fights he took in a short amount of time. Both of those things bit him in the ass in the end. But still, Brian Barbarina, he can crow about this victory if he wants to. But that was not a perfectly executed arm triangle. It was not even close to one. What I would say to him is there's two things I took away from this fight. Barbarina can definitely celebrate. I wouldn't celebrate too much if I was him because you just beat Dana's golden boy. Right. And if you're Seth, you could still say, well, I'm undefeated at 155. That's true. He moved up in weight, so maybe it doesn't hurt him long term. What about you? What do you take away from this fight? I take away from this fight that Sage Northcutt needs to have a little more heart because... Far be it for me to say you don't have heart. He's a kid. No, 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 no. no. Let, let me finish first. Far okay. be it for me to say that a fighter doesn't have heart because it takes heart just to take a fight, let alone get in the cage and do it in front of a crowd. And yeah, he is young, but youth has nothing to do with it here. My point is we've seen guys fight a lot harder to get out of submissions than Sage Northcutt did. 
Maybe that's just inexperience. Maybe that's just he's he's not been in that much pressure before in terms of having to take so many fights in such a short amount of time. But then he also needs to be wiser than that and not take so many fights in that short of time. So he, he needs heart and he, he also needs common sense. He needs to know when enough is enough. It's true. Definitely is true. It's just I'm wondering how long we'll wait to see him on the next show. I hope he takes longer this time. I hope he waits three or four months and puts in a full camp at TriStar and really comes in ready. Yeah, because TriStar is one of the best out there, so... Indeed. Now, let's move on to the prelim card. We had Tarek Safadine defeating Jake Ellenberger. I think that's pretty much a wrap for Jake. He hasn't been cut, but he's lost almost all of his relevance in the welterweight class. And I, I say that because... As we discussed off the air, I'm not a homer. Just because a guy's from my town doesn't mean I won't call the truth when I see it. But you look at who he's lost to, it's a who's who. It's not like he's been fed tomato cans by any means. No, I'm not saying that he hasn't fought the cream of the crop, but he's lost five out of the last six, and the only guy he beat was Koscheck. So, I kind of feel like the writing's on the wall for him. He's not even ranked in the top 15 anymore. And he's probably not going to be anytime soon. Maybe they give him one more fight, one last chance, and then he's probably going to bounce to Bellator. Or World Series. Whoever will pay him the most. Hmm. Uh, Diego Ferreira beat Olivier Aubin Mercier. Unanimous decision. Now, this is one where I'm definitely going to say youth plays a factor. Unlike Sage Northcutt, where he just got overwhelmed by being put in too many fights and then didn't have the experience to know what to do to try to fight back or get out of a submission attempt. With Aubin Mercier, it's just like he's he's so young in his career. He's pretty. He's not as young as Northcutt, but he's as young in experience, I would say, and just had never been in there with an elite jiu-jitsu guy at the level of Diego Ferreira, a guy who can control the positions in the cage and you know, Alba Mercier has a lot of skill, and he has a lot that can be developed into becoming an elite fighter, but he's still so young in his career that he just got taken advantage by a seasoned veteran here, somebody that could just outwork him and outposition him, and and I don't even know if I want to use the word outclass him, because, I mean, Alba Mercier, it, it, he still had heart. He didn't get finished. He didn't tap out. He didn't get knocked out, but he just got beaten by a more experienced man. That's all you can really say about them. <clears throat> now, Rafael, Rafael Natal, Natal. Yeah. King Kevin Casey. Yep. He TKO'd Kevin Casey. The king goes down. Yep. Well, it happens. Yeah, it happened pretty late but, in the fight, though. There was like a minute and change left. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Other fights of interest... Alexander Yakolev beating George Sullivan only took him 359 to knock him out. Yeah, uh, I believe that's the second fastest fight of the card other than the main event. Mm-hmm. Bruce Leroy beat Massio Fullen 30-27 across the board. Mm-hmm. And Wilson Hayes beat Dustin Ortiz 30-27 across the board. And Stevie's favorite decision happened on the fight pass as Damon Jackson fought Levin Maxisvili to a majority draw. Thanks to a one-point deduction due to an illegal knee and an eye poke on Makashvili's part. Did you cringe a little bit when you saw that eye poke? Yes. I I knew we were getting a draw the moment that happened. Like, ah, shit. Yeah, you needed to come back and get like a 10-8 or something. Or or knock the guy out, which he clearly wasn't going to do. But But I also cringed I, I, I'm just going to say, I I forgot about that, and I didn't even mind that there were so many decisions on the prelims, because once the main card got rolling, it was good action from bottom to top. I also cringed because I thought of a Mitrion. Oh, of course, yeah. Hey, do you think Mitrion's going to Bellator? Hmm, how's their vision plan? I suppose it's pretty good. I'm sure Spike TV and Viacom have a nice health plan. 
Well, you talk to you talk to Koscheck about breaking your orbital bone. So that's very true. But yeah, you probably have a lot of friends in Bellator these days. There'd be a lot of guys there you'd know. Well, his contract is know. up. He can go if he wants to. And I don't see UFC necessarily matching Bellator's offer if they give him a good offer. Now, did I hear right, or is there a, a contract issue with, um, was it Alistair Overeem? I think his contract might be up, but I don't know yeah, if Yeah, like he's not... I don't know if there's an issue. I would think they would probably re-sign Overeem. You think so? I think he's one of their bigger name fighters and... His, uh, whether you consider him famous or infamous, everybody knows who Overeem is, so I would think they would keep him around. Well, I mean, if he doesn't, he always go back to Japan. Yeah, he could, but uh, then he'd end up in the Fedor position where he's fighting tomato cans to stay over as the star. And maybe that's not what he wants. Maybe he wants to maybe. fight real competition. Or he fights Fedor. I don't know about that one. I don't know if I really want to well, see Well, I'm sorry, but if the money is there on the table, he could do what Benson did and take the money and run. I'm not saying he shouldn't take the money if that's what they give him the money to do. I'm just saying that in terms of what I would enjoy watching, I don't know that I would enjoy watching Fedor and Overeem at this point. Maybe I look at the seven, opportunity, eight, though. Yeah. ten years ago that would have been a good fight. I don't know if that's a good fight now. I think if Ryzen is able to poach over him and Bellator is able to punch uh, Benson, Dana White's going to be sitting there going, oh, crap, now what do we do? Well, you also have to keep in mind that they have to bid as much or more than UFC to get any of these guys. And Rising, I don't know that they have the budget for that if they're already paying Fedor or whatever kind of money they need to keep him. Mm. Also, we had some UFC cuts this past week. Uh, Mike Pierce was the big name of note on this one. Yeah, well, there were about a dozen names on the list, and he was probably the most notable one of the bunch. So it's spring cleaning because of so many signings. Well, nobody that they cut was on a win streak. Everybody had lost like one, two, three, or four fights when they were cut. So there was one fighter. There was one fighter. I forget which one, but it was win, loss, win, loss, win. Like it's just basically. But his last fight fighter. Was, his last fight was a loss. Everybody that oh, was yeah. cut was on a loss. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I guess they're in a cutting mood right now. Mm-hmm. Well, All right, so let's I, move I feel, on. I feel like last call Danny Castillo was a pretty notable name on that list as well. Yeah, I'll miss last call, but I'm confident he'll be back one day. Mm-hmm. The, other, the other guys... uh pretty much middling to uh you wouldn't even know or remember them you know like Constantine Arokin he was 0 and 2 in two UFC fights so is anybody going to remember that guy no no now you want to move on to Bellator yeah let's move on to Bellator so Paul Daly versus Andy Urich i mean <laughs> Yeah, we we all knew what was going to happen, and that was exactly what happened. Stevie Wonder was watching the fight and said, called it. <laughs> that was the only thing I got right all night, too. So if I'm going to say called it, I'm going to say it about the one that I did. I just, look, I understand the fight. I understand why this fight took place, but it I was, thought it would be more of a fight. Yeah, well, I kind of hope so, too, because... Yurik's a good guy, he's a friend of ours, he's talked mm-hmm. a good game, he's fought some good guys, but he does have... Two minutes! I, I, Two I know. minutes! I know, this is why I said what I said on the show, like, we like the guy, we're, we're friends with him, he's a good dude, mm-hmm. but we know whether he wants to say it or not, we know that he's got a chin that can be cracked, because guys lesser than Paul Daly have done it to him. And Paul Daly is one of the best strikers in the game, so mm-hmm. this result was inevitable. Paul Bradley beating uh, Chris Honeycutt in 40 seconds. This one was the complete wild card of the bunch. Like, mm-hmm. I, I can admit, in hindsight, that I should have looked at the other two fights differently and I would have figured it out. But this one 
no way in hell I saw this coming, especially since the last time they fought, Honeycutt was getting the better of him with takedowns, and Honeycutt has a record of hitting people really hard really early in fights, and he's young and got a lot of going for him, and uh, well, none of that worked for him because he just got blitzed by Bradley and just creamed right behind the ear, and once he dropped to the ground, he was finished. So you were talking about Honeycutt or Couture? Actually, kind of the same story, I guess, because Patricky, yeah, I I thought he was taking the fight too quick. I thought Couture would take him down and go for a submission. This one's Couture's own fault because he decided, I'm going to stand here and bang with Pitbull. Who told him? Who told him? Who told him that was a good idea? Who made that call? I mean, when he got his nose split open, that should have been like, okay, let's go for a takedown. No, he got his nose split open and he still stood there in front of him. Bad game plan. No offense, Couture. Bad game plan. It's okay. He takes uh, the experience of this loss and he gets better. You would hope so, because the next time he goes up against a guy who is a striker of the caliber of Patricky Ferry, he won't make that same decision. And Tony Johnson against Raphael Butler with Johnson getting the knockout at the 424 of the third round. Not the knockout, the TKO, but... TKO. He was pretty handily winning the fight up to that point. It was shades of his fight with Alexander Volkov, where he just out-wrestled his opponent, took him down, and held him against the cage when he got back up. So I thought he was just going to write out a decision, and then in the third round, Raphael Butler just ran out of gas and couldn't stop him from just dominating him on the ground. So it was a good stoppage, but it, it was one of those fights where, like, in hindsight... I really should have seen it coming, because I, I bought into the hype. Butler told me he was ever improving as a fighter, and he looked good in his last fight with Josh Diekman, so I thought he had something here. But Tony Johnson just did what Tony Johnson does, and he out-wrestles people. On the prelims, um, one fight that I looked uh, at, looking forward to, I should say, was Tay Edwards against Nick Bustamante. Not Busamati's best night. <laughs> no, he got knocked out in 43 seconds. Yeah, I think he's still looking for the number of that truck. Yeah, you could also say the same thing about Javi Ayala after, let me try to not butcher this name, Seu Manatafa, after he just got steamrolled by Seu Manatafa in the second round. Yeah. Now, one fight I didn't catch, I don't know if you have this result or not, but Eric Higgins and Jeremiah McDermott. Uh, yeah, I believe that was very early in the prelims, and that was a Kimura. McDermott won the fight. I always miss the cool submissions. Mm-hmm. I like when a Kimura, a good plan gets, you know what I mean? Like just, you that's love a sweet it when move. a plan comes together, eh, Hannibal? Absolutely. Oh my god, we are so dating ourselves with this one. Call the show the 80s references. Jesus. Well, speaking of 80s references, then, let's talk about the way that Alima McFarlane was a Wonder Woman in there with Amber Tackett. Oh, good reference. <laughs> um, Yeah, I love the fact they had to put... The, I know you have to say this, but verbal submission. She couldn't take any more, or something more clever than just verbal submission. Just, ow, ow, like, you know what I mean? They're going to tell you, if you are in pain and say, ow, ow, I am stopping this fight. That's the rule in every promotion everywhere. Oh, jeez. I mean, we've seen rules meetings where they tell you this. Yeah, I've sat in the rules meeting. I've heard John McCarthy explain this to fighters explicitly. He says, if you visibly scream in pain and I can see and hear you, the fight's over. Yeah, it's just, uh, oh, I just, it's a good win for her, that's for sure. Yeah, and at least this hopefully ends the whole soccer mom thing. At least now with, with a win under her belt in Bellator, we can get over that and move on. Oh, I didn't see that link from 1FC last week. I'm still calling it 1FC. Um, there was a soccer kick finish. I know when he said soccer mom, it, it, I was reminded of this fight, but, the guy, or did I send this to you? You probably did. It was like, 
it was a, it was very reminiscent. I know we're using wrestling on this, but it was definitely the RK, uh, the Randy Orton kick to the head. You know, and it was like, oh god. <laughs> speaking, speaking of Randy Orton, did you see what Richard Sherman tried to do in the Pro Bowl? Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> I knew you were going to bring that up. Well, you you started it by bringing up Randy Orton, and, and I just love but how did Clay. You see who he tried to I, I know on? Clay Matthews, and Clay completely no sold it and shrugged him off. You know, Clay Matthews is a pro wrestling fan. He should have come up to him between plays and said, "After this play is over, let's do an RKO spot." If he if he had told him ahead of time, he probably would have been down with it. Well, if we're going to talk sports, why don't you talk about Patrick Kane and John Scott fighting in the All Star game? Well, John Scott is known as an enforcer, so what did you expect? It was all fun and games. Yeah. But Clay Matthews was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just shrugged it off like, uh-uh, I'm not in the mood for that. But the person who sent me the the link for the 1FC, the soccer kick, right, mm-hmm. asked me this question, and I'll pose this to you. Do you think there will be a time where we will ever see soccer kicks legal I in really, UFC? I really don't want it. I, I think that's a relic of the old days, and I think it should stay there. It's too dangerous? I don't know if I want to judge what's dangerous, because, like I said before, just getting in a cage is dangerous and requires a lot of moxie on the part of the person that's doing it. So, it's not like it's more or less dangerous. It just, it, it to me, represents a style of fighting that's no longer applicable to fighting today. I think in the commission state that we're in now, you won't. I mean, you have a better chance legalizing to fold the six elbows. That actually needs to be done. That rule needs to be done away with. Yeah, but... I know, it's on the books and it's hard to get anything changed. We've been over that before. We've been over that before, but my point is, for the 12 to 6, we don't have any long-term effects. Like, there's no real studies that can be done to prove the long-term damage of getting hit with a 12 to 6. I mean, that could rattle your brain 10 times worse for all we know. I think a soccer kick is going to rattle more than a 12 to 6 elbow. Yeah, I just... It's scary to think if these fighters ever want to go in UFC and they're very proficient in the, the, the soccer kick, they go to, oh, I can't use that anymore, shit. Well... You just got to know the rules where you're fighting, because every, every place you fight in the world is going to be a little bit different. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's move on to this week's show with uh, the UFC Super Bowl weekend with Hendrix and Wonder Boy in the main event. That's absolutely right. So let's take a look not just at the fact that it's Hendrix and Wonder Boy and it's the former UFC 196 and it's an interesting card all the way up and down, but... The fact that for one of these guys, it, it is potentially a really big deal in their weight class to uh, get them on track because, I mean, Wonder Boy, he, he needs a win like this over a former champion to really yeah. solidify his place in line, whereas with Hendricks, he's lost two out of his last four, but the two guys that he lost to are the current champion and the former champion, so not much skin off that. you got to feel like he, like you said before with Ellenberger, it's not like he was fighting scrubs, but he really needs to put more than one win in a row together just to say, I'm still here, I'm still a force to be reckoned with. What do you say if, <clears throat> what do you say to those fighter, uh, those pundits out there who are looking at this fight and you, you heard the stories that, you know, this fight's the main event, it couldn't draw on pay-per-view that's why it's a fight past fight i know it's super bowl weekend and this is traditionally a big show for ufc but what would you say to those that are saying this is only a main event for the hardcores i think you can still get some casual fans interested in this because of the fact that hendrix is a former champion and there are some other intriguing fights that involve people that casual fans will know, and we'll get to those in a minute, but I think if you're putting this on free TV, and, well, not free free, because you still got to pay for cable or satellite, but free as compared to paying forty nine ninety five or fifty four ninety five, whatever amount you would pay to watch it on pay-per-view. I think 
there are fans out there who might not have spent that money because it's Super Bowl weekend and they were going to have a party and invite a bunch of people over and their budget was already spent, who are going to hear that and they're going to go, all right, free fights, let's let's watch. Exactly. It's going to be... Do you think this, this will be a trend now that the Super Bowl show will be like a, a free show or do you think this is going to be just a blip? I think they'll go back to having pay-per-views on Super Bowl weekend. I think... That's a tradition, not just because of the fact that it's the Super Bowl weekend, but because they always seem to hold that card in Las Vegas, and that's the sports betting capital of the world. So you'd want to run one of your biggest cards of the year on one of the biggest weekends of the year for sports fans. Well, I just, when it comes to this fight, the main event, I mean, yeah, hey, look, two guys are bashing the crap out of each other. Let's watch. I don't know. I just, Hendrix definitely has the power to end this fight early. And he has the wrestling ability to take him down and make it a grinder, too. I just wish he could, you know, make weight. You know what I mean? Well, this is the test. If he doesn't make it, then he's got to be done at welterweight. If he doesn't make the weight for this fight, and this fight gets pulled from the card, they either cut him or they force him to go up. Well, yeah. I'm just, I'm I'm very, not undecisive with this main event. I'm like, I I feel Hendricks is going to make short work of Wonderboy here. Well, he is minus 220, so you're probably on the money, no pun intended. Thompson is plus 180. Not bad. No, he's got a shot. But you're not picking him. I'm not picking him. No, neither am I. I'm going with Hendricks on that one. Let's move on to... <laughs> we talked about big boys in the cage. Roy Nelson and Jared Rosholt. Now, this is the one where I said you're going to get some casual fan interest other than the main event because almost everybody knows who Big Country is. If you watch this in a bar, I'm sure you'll get the Buddha belly chant. Indeed. Or Cheeseburger, which actually happened at a show I went to where he was in the main event. Is he still coming out to Michael Jackson? Or Weird Al, sorry? I haven't been to one of his fights live in a while, so when they show it on TV, unless it's a pay-per-view, they usually cut out the entrance. That sucks. Yeah, so this is the one where I'm actually going to tell people, take the dog in this fight. Nelson is the favorite. He's minus 160, but these guys have the exact opposite records. Rocholtz won 5 out of 6, and Nelson has lost 5 out of 6. And I know Big Country has one-punch knockout power, but we've seen how people beat that, and that's just control him on the ground and out-wrestle him. If you can do that and you can avoid his power, you can win the fight. And Rochelle is an Oklahoma State three-time All-American, and he's pretty much the wet blanket of the heavyweight division. He takes people down and holds them down. And I firmly believe he will do that to big country. You may not like the fight, but he'll win the fight. Well, if he wins the fight, he wins the fight. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I see Nelson winning this, but... I think it's going to be tougher than than he thinks. Yeah, I'm not saying a three-round decision, but... The, the days where Roy Nelson was just steamrolling through people by putting one on their chin are over. Those days are gone. No. Uh, I mean, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. Those days are long gone. It's just... How many... F- this is... Bu- the, let me try this again. This has been bugging me about Nelson. I know he's a fan favorite. I get that, you know, he, as you said, the casual fans will be like, hey, I know that guy. But I'm wary of Nelson. Like, how much more, how many more fights do we have of Nelson in the UFC? I think that time is coming to a near end. If he loses one or two more, that's probably it. Mm. If his contract doesn't run out, he'll get cut one or the other. But do you, I'm not saying he'll jump ship to Bellator or World Series or anything. I'm saying, do you think 
he is long for mixed martial arts. I mean, I could see him being a coach or a trainer, but I don't know how many more fights we have over Roy Nelson. Yeah, I I feel like he peaked and he's been in the decline for a little bit. And I'm with you on that one that he just may not be fighting anymore. It may just come to a point where he's done and he's not going to go to Bellator anywhere else because he's just done. He's already paid his dues and had all the big main events he can. Yeah, I mean, he's made none of, lots of money, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. So nothing wrong with that. And the country club, as he calls it, is probably well stocked. So I would imagine so, so... No shame in his game, but I don't see him winning this fight. No. Oh, you don't? Okay. Uh, Rafael Cavacante against OSP. I like OSP in this fight. You know, I'm, I think I'm gonna go with Cavacante on this one. Really? Puncher's chance. Yeah, except Fei Zhao is a guy who lives by the sword and dies by the sword. He's lost three out of his last four, and he gets knocked out a lot. Okay, but the reason I'm picking him, I love going back to this example, but, I mean, what does he have to lose? I mean, if he gets knocked out, if he gets beaten this fight, he's done. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. I know he's being fed to the slaughter here. I get that. But if he beats OSP... He's right back in the thick of things. That's true, but OSB has first round finishing power. I mean, he's finished both Shogun Hua and Patrick Cummins in recent fights, and both of those guys are durable and tough as hell, so that tells you the kind of power that OSB can hit people with. He's a minus 360 favorite for a reason. And again, Fei Zhao lives by the sword and dies by the sword. It's an amazing thing about this guy to me. It's like if he concentrated on his jiu-jitsu game instead of trying to stand and bang with people, he'd probably win a lot more fights. I don't know. I just... With Fei Zhao, I mean... I've been a fan of his for a while, so, like... Yeah, I, I, see I him. like the guy. I've liked him ever since his strike force days, but he's just... He's not that guy anymore. It's 2016. Well... I'm going with uh with Cavacante on this one. All right. Well, that's your choice. I respect your choice, but I honestly think Ovens Peru is eating him for lunch. What are the odds on uh Kirkenoff and Nicholson? I don't have the odds for that. I tried to look them up and there weren't any. All right. Uh coin flip, I'll go Nicholson. Sure, I'll go Nicholson too. Mike Pyle and Sean Spencer wrap up the main card. Yeah, and in that one, I'm well, it's not as easy to call <laughs> as I thought. And, <laughs> well, I want to say Spencer, but Spencer's been out of action for over a year, and ring rust is a real thing. I like True. Spencer, but only because Quicksand Pile has been sinking in his own quicksand, so... I'll take Spencer, but I'm taking him reluctantly because I hope that year off hasn't hurt him. You think it hurts him? I, I don't know what his camps have been like. I don't know how active he's been. If he's been injured this whole time and hasn't put in full camps, who knows what kind of Spencer we're getting. Again, I'm taking him, but a little reluctantly. Okay. The prelims, there's a couple of names on here that will catch your interest, Josh Berkman and KJ Noons especially? Yeah. I I don't know if the People's Warrior is the same guy that he was in World Series fighting, but I, I don't know about either of these guys. What do you think? I'll take Berkman. I'm kind of leaning that way myself, but I, I'm feeling like the level of UFC competition since he jumped back to UFC it it may be too much for him, but I'll I'll go ahead and take him. The scary thing with me is that whenever I doubt KJ Noons, that's when he knocks somebody the fuck out. Yeah, he is a former pro boxing champion, so he he's got that ability to finish people at any time. If they leave it open for him, he can take it. 
Uh, there's a couple other fighters I'm interested in on this on the prelims. One is uh, Ray Borg and Justin Scogans. Mm. That's probably interesting a, fight there. It's probably a coin flip fight, but I'll go with Borg. Okay, I'll go with Scoggins. Sure. And of course, everyone's favorite prelim fight on Fight Pass: Mickey Gale against Mike Jackson. Well, Mickey Gale or Gall, I think actually not Gale okay. for the win. <laughs> Mike Jackson has the win. no chance, no chance in hell. I swear if he comes out to Thriller, I will lose my shit. That would be pretty cool, but again, we won't see it. Oh, boy. All right, so <laughs> it's going to be an interesting card. Oh, you know what? Fight actually, Night 82. Actually, we probably will see it since it's on Fight Pass. We actually yeah. get the entrance. Unlike the stuff that's on Fox Sports 1, we'll get, if he comes out to Thriller, we will see it. <laughs> now, we move on to the news, and uh, I asked you this off air. We don't have it yet, but we expect uh, the announcement any day now with John Jones and Daniel Cormier, too. Yes, very likely to happen very, very soon. Now, did you, after Northcutt tapped out to the choke there, did you see Barbarina's flip afterwards? Yeah, he was pretty ecstatic. That's a pretty good flip, actually. I was impressed. I think he was kind of mocking Sage Northcutt, because, you know, Northcutt always does the break dancing and the spinning after he wins his fight. So I think he was like, okay, kid, you think you're out shit? Look what I can do. Did you hear what Bruce Leroy said after his fight? No, but I'm sure you're about to tell me. He's, imagine this, Stevie. He's done cutting weight. He's happy at 145. Well, you know what? That's good for a lot of people these days, especially with IVs being banned and water cutting now being seriously looked at. I would say stay at 145. It's working for you. Stay there. Absolutely. I, I find it interesting that more fighters haven't taken this to task yet. I mean, unfortunately, with 1FC, they've, they've made that decision to bump everybody up one level, basically. Which so that I don't blame them for it. After what happened no. to them, that was a good choice on their part. Just sad that someone someone's it life ended. It should have taken a tragedy. That. No, it should have been yeah. figured out before that. But sometimes it turns out for the best. And not that you want that to happen for it to happen, but if it saves more lives, then it it had a net benefit overall. Now we talked last week about John Jones going to heavyweight and challenging. Uh, State Miocic for the heavyweight title. It's like, um, no. We're good, thanks. Like, no. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently he wants to have three more fights at 205. Now, I don't know if that means he's going to retire or if it means he's going to jump to heavyweight. But he wants to fight three more times at 205. And, of course, he's want, he wants to fight Cormier, Johnson, and the Mauler. That sounds about right to me. That's the three biggest fights out there for him. So, beat him, beat him, beat him. It's like trading cards. Want him, want him, have him. <laughs> um, did you hear Ben Rothwell's comment at the press conference? Or, was it either press conference or post fight, I can't remember, but he talked about his submission skills. I think I remember what he said, but refresh my memory anyway. Well, as a gamer, you'll like this. He referred to his submission skills as using a cheat code. That's right. <laughs> and of course, I'm going to date myself again, but when he said that, I thought of Game Genie. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, a potential fight could be Robbie Lawler and Tyrone Woodley. I'd like that. <laughs> I... I, mm, yeah, I mean, who else is Lawler going to fight? Yeah, he needs contenders, and T. Wood is a guy that's right there in the mix. Yeah, I, I just, do you think it's a, a fight, like, is it a winnable fight for Woodley? Hey, he does have the power, if he gets one on the chin, he can put people away, so, winnable, yes. Possible? I would have to think about it some more before I gave you my final yeah. decision on that. Lawler is just on such a tear right now. Right, but 
the thing is, Lawler keeps getting into these wars, and yeah, he's on a tear right now, but the kind of wars he's getting into, they take a toll after a while. Now, I'm going to take a page from, uh, what was like the, like the, the weird file, or like the obscure file, or whatever it is. So this is Baptist Preacher. Stop me if you've, stop me if you've heard this before. So a Baptist preacher is hoping that Conor McGregor gets struck down by a lightning bolt. Oh, yeah, I did see that story. What? (laughs) What? (laughs) What? I think they just feel that he's he's become sacrilegious because he talks about himself as being God in the octagon and everything. Well, keep knocking out champions, see what happens. Um, I know we you know, talk about stage saying, North Side. You know, there's an old saying about that. What's that? Your arms are too short to box with God. No, <laughs> that's a good one, actually. <laughs> uh, we talk about Northcutt going to TriStar, but there's another fighter that's going to be going full time to TriStar. And who would that be? Tarek Safadine. Yeah, well, he is the sponge of MMA, so go to TriStar and soak up whatever knowledge you can from the guys there. Stagan Miocic is hopefully gonna, he wants to fight, uh, Verdum in, uh, late spring, early summer. Well, I feel like they kinda owe it to him now, cause he agreed to the fight on short notice, and then Verdum pulled out, so, it's not Stipe's fault there's not a fight on Saturday. It's, it's Verdum's. Can I make a suggestion for that show? What's that? Memorial Day or Victoria Day? Hmm. Sure, why not? Did you hear about the main event for Bellator 149? Uh, as far as I know, that's still Shamrock Gracie 3. Melvin Gillard and Derek Campos. Yeah, that got added to the card because... Mike, oh, sorry, that's the added to the card, right? Yeah, yeah. Mike Bronzoulis was supposed to fight Melvin Gillard. He pulled out with an injury, and Derek Campos is stepping in. Swear to God, if I hear one more fighter or wrestler getting injured, I'm going to lose my shit. Hey, that's the nature of the beast here. People overtrain, people get hurt. I know, I know. It's just, I find it's an epidemic at this rate. I mean, yes, I get that you have to train hard to to, to get to where you are. I understand that, but there's got to be a better way. Well, at some point, people are going to figure out what that better way is, but this is still a very young sport. We have to keep reminding ourselves that full-time professional mixed martial arts that people can make a living at by fighting in organizations like UFC has only been around for a couple of decades and change, so there's still a lot of stuff to be figured out about this sport. The uh, Let's move on to the California State Athletic Commission. Uh they have suspended the coach of Ronda Rousey for falsifying paperwork. Yep, Tarvidian got slapped with a fine and a one-month suspension. If you, I, I wonder how they're going to collect that fine since Tarvidian claimed bankruptcy. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, you're drawing blood from a stone? Blood from a turnip, same difference. Blood from a turnip. Wait, you never <laughs> heard that one before? It's been a while since I've heard that one. Uh, all right, so for some reason involving our contract, Jake Shields is pulled out of World Series of Fighting 30. John Fitch will now fight uh, Duo, Duo Zafrino. Oh, yeah, from the tournament, from the World Series of Fighting 25 tournament. So do you know any details on the contract, what happened there? Or? I have not heard a word. Nobody in World Series of Fighting has spoken to me about it nor have I had any opportunity to speak to anybody, like, reach out and get information. It's totally oblivious to me at this point what happened. I won't know until somebody comes out of the woodwork and either goes on the record or lets me interview them and get the official statement. But right now, I know as much as you. Okay, so did some digging on this one. I thought maybe you heard a press release or something. But, um... Apparently, has to do. Jake Shields had a problem with World Series of Fighting's championship clause. Oh, so it would it he be... informed the promotion. No, go um, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. 
I'm, I'm, I'm just translating it. Basically, he doesn't want to get stuck in a championship clause unless he can come to terms. And I'm not saying they're holding him at ransom, but he doesn't want to be forced to fight for a title, so he couldn't come to terms for his fight against John Fitch and didn't decline to sign the fight agreement. So, hmm. uh, there must be more than I have a quote. There I more... got a quote here. I'm going to read it. All right, who's the quote from? Jake Shields. All right, what did he say? We weren't way off with money. Basically, they're saying there's go- they're going to hold my contract. They're trying to say I'm coming off a loss and therefore I can't negotiate for more money. But they're trying to force me to fight for a title, so it seems a little bit ridiculous. If I can't negotiate coming off a loss, why do I fight for a title? I just want to fight my last fight of my contract to be a free agent or renegotiate a contract for the title fight. Hmm. Well, there's definitely an argument to be made for that if you're the fighter and you're in that position, so... I but can... why would you give him a title shot if he only has one fight left on his contract? Well, they're giving him the title shot, or they wanted to give him the title shot because the guy he lost to got stripped of the title, so in theory, he probably should be the number one contender considering that he lost to a guy that's no longer valid as the champion, so... He was the last guy the champion faced and probably the first guy in line for the next title shot. That's how Sounds I like would look at it. Sounds like a headache to me. Also, you got to think about the name value. Jake Shields, John Fitch, those guys have more name value than a lot of the other guys in that weight class in that promotion. So you got to go with the recognized guys. Yeah, you got to go on the backs of uh, name fighters for the casual fans and... Hopefully it gets some interest in your product. Oh, I think there's interest out there. I think that's part of the problem is that that's what they feel is the interest and he probably just feels like, okay, you're going to make me take a tile shot, then renegotiate my contract and pay me what a tile shot's worth. So next week, I believe, is the Shamrock card. Well, February 19th is the Shamrock card and then February 20th is the next World Series of Fighting. Yeah, we don't have a UFC show after this weekend until, uh, Cerrone and Tim, oh my god, already. <laughs> Cerrone and Means is already coming up. And Silva and Bisping. Oh, well, great. Can I get my Fight Pass subscription? Yes, you do. Alright, well, that's gonna do it for the show this week. Is there anything, uh, coming up on Thursday Night AMP? Just the usual. Jordan, Jason, maybe happy. <laughs> All right, any closing plugs? I think I'll just say follow us on Twitter at HardcoreCDN and at Angry Marks. And Peter, you need to use your Twitter a little more often to plug the show. I know. I've just been very busy with uh, various commitments to work. I Yeah, but how long does it take to send a tweet? 30 seconds? Oh, less? I know. I know. I know. I know. But let's just say one of the places where I work, I'm not going to say where, but Let's just say that certain firewalls do not allow tweeting. I see. <laughs> okay. I can understand that. You get a pass on that. There you go. All right. Well, for Stevie J at Angry Marks, I'm Peter H at Hardcore CDN. Thanks for listening. And as I always say, never leave it to the judges. Good night, everybody. See ya. <laughs>